and welcome to Game Changers, Tufts Women in Professional Sports. We are Lisa Lax and Nancy Stern Winters, proud Jackson 86 alums and former tennis, squash, and lacrosse jumbos. We currently are the co-founders of Lookalike Productions. We produce and direct documentary films and television specials. We're currently working on the film tributes for the Kennedy Center Honors and a series for NBC Olympics that will stream on Peacock, celebrating the 25th anniversary of the gold medal winning women's teams from the 1996 Atlanta Games, including basketball, soccer, softball, and team gymnastics. Although we can't gather in person, we're thrilled to welcome alums, parents, and friends of Tufts to this event around the globe as part of a virtual reunion week. Now we'd like to introduce two very special guests from the class of 1996. Sonia Rahman, who currently holds the position of assistant coach for the NBA's Memphis Grizzlies, and from the class of 2005, professional triathlete and corporate analyst for Ferguson Enterprises, Sika Henry. Welcome to you both, and congratulations on all of your amazing accomplishments. Nancy and I were really excited to be part of this event when we heard about the two of you and found it fascinating that not only have you both achieved incredible success, but you have somewhat parallel journeys. You are both walk-ons at Tufts, Sonia in basketball, Sika in track and field. You both persevered through serious injuries that could have been possible career enders, and both of you have strong thoughts about the importance of inclusion and paving the way for future generations. We'd like you both to tell us a little bit about your career paths and how it all began at Tufts. Sonia, you first. You're from Framingham, Massachusetts. You are pre-med, walk-on in basketball, and graduated with a degree in international relations. How did you get your career started at Tufts Athletics? Well, actually, I just walked in the door of the head coach's office and asked about how to try out. Um, you know, I wasn't recruited, so, um, you know, I, I loved basketball and wanted to stay involved and be on a team. Um, I had been, you know, working out all summer in hopes of even being able to, you know, get a tryout. I didn't know how any of it worked, um, but I walked into Coach Sharon Dolly's office, and um, she was really great, um, you know, welcomed me in, gave me the workouts, and, you know, uh, introduced me to the captains at the time, and I was really lucky to just kind of get in with a really um, welcoming group that really helped me get ready for that first day of the season. And Sika, you became an NCAA All-American as a walk-on high jumper with a degree in economics. Could you tell us a little bit about your start at, as a jumbo? Uh, sure. So I actually swam all four years of high school. I never had any experience with track and field. Um, but I did try it the end of my senior year of high school, and um, I want to say the first time I jumped, it was about 5'2", and uh, the high school coach was like, you should contact the coach at Tufts. I had already gotten in at that point. I chose Tufts, and I uh, reached out to Coach Kristen Morwick. She's still the head track and field coach there now for the women, and um, I asked if I could walk on, and she said, sure, come on out, and I just seemed to have a knack for it. I really um, bonded quickly with the team. They ended up becoming my, my roommates um, all four years of college, and yeah, I went on to do sprints and high jump. That's, a, that's incredible, both of you to do walk-ons now, especially nowadays um, with all the recruiting process and everything. Um, Sonia, can you tell us a little bit about your injuries, your junior and senior year, and how um, staying on the sidelines sort of changed your perspective from being a player potentially into your new career. Sure. Um, you know, looking back, a pretty life-changing event, although in the moment you don't know that. You know, you're um, 20 years old and, you know, you have a broken leg and you're in the middle of your season. So that was the situation I was in. Um, and certainly, you know, really disappointing to then lose the whole second half of my junior year on the court along with the first half of my senior year. Uh, but it was a pretty serious injury and, um, you know, it was a, a car that hit me on campus. Um, so, you know, in many ways it gave me a really good perspective to be helpful to your coaches and just trying to learn everything we're doing. I would just kind of stand behind my, my head coach and the assistant coaches and learn what they were doing, try to really understand, you know, game plans, X's and O's, scouting reports, um, I would grab extra film and watch it on my VHS player. So um, I think I learned a lot of what it's like from a point of view of the sidelines um, when you take playing time out of the equation and all of that and you know you're just rehabbing. Um, you can really start to develop leadership skills um, and, and kind of a little mini internship in, in coaching. 
I think all really amazing lessons for um, for some of the jumbo athletes who are who are listening in today. Um, not only for athletics, but in in life in general. Um, it's really incredible how you um, parlayed everything. Um, Sika, as, as a high jumper, did you ever imagine that you would? like envision your life as an endurance athlete and how did that come to pass? I, I know that you had a goal of competing a marathon and when you did that, did you have an epiphany? Uh, no, it's actually quite funny because I did not like running at all in college. I, Kristen would make us just do a mile warm up, and um, I, I thought that was too long. <laughs> um, and then once a week she'd have me run, um, I wanna say like three miles to Harvard Square and back and I just hated it so no, I had absolutely no idea what was to come, that I would be doing Ironmans and stuff. Um, but after I graduated college and I was working on finance in Manhattan, um, I got out of shape and I missed, I guess, the team camaraderie and being active and balancing multiple things outside of just my career. So I did put on my bucket list that I wanted to complete a marathon. Um, every year I'd watch the Boston Marathon in college and. Um, I'm from right outside of New York City, so I watched the New York City Marathon, and um, my first marathon was a disaster. <laughs> I did not train properly for it at all. I'd never done a half marathon, and I was pretty much uh, puking and walking by mile 20. I hit the proverbial wall, but um, somehow I still broke four hours, and I felt like if I had prepared properly and um, actually followed a training plan that I could be pretty decent at it. So I took some time and I trained properly and the second marathon I did, I actually won. Um, so it was just shocking. Um, and I guess I found out that I had- That's a, awesome. Yeah, <laughs> I felt like I had a natural uh, talent, like a natural ability. I could keep running and running and hold the same pace for a long period of time. Um, and from there, I uh, wanted to try triathlon because I had swam all four years of high school and I knew all I needed was a bike. So there was a local sprint triathlon that I signed up for. I only had about two weeks to prepare and I did that one. And um, yeah, it kind of just took off from there. And before I knew it, I was doing half Ironmans and then the full Ironman at the World Championships in Kona, Hawaii. That's amazing. In fact, actually, we, we sort of have a um, little bit of a crossover because I used to work at NBC Sports and produced all of the Ironman shows for about seven or eight years. So I know what it takes to uh, finish an Ironman and especially in Hawaii. So congratulations to you. <laughs> um, yeah, it's a pretty incredible. And now, Sonia, you have a really unlikely path to be coaching in the NBA. Can you tell us a little bit about your early coaching career at Tufts and then Wellesley, and then you became a lawyer and, your, and you were doing coaching part-time, and then how did you make your decision to leave the law to ultimately coach full-time at MIT? And tell us a little bit about that experience. And, and also, how did you balance it all? I mean, <laughs> talk about multitasking. Yeah, um, you know, I... I loved basketball and I think that time that I alluded to where I was injured late in my college career kind of led to and, and fueled my interest in coaching. Um, it was never a really conscious decision that I wanted to coach as a career until much later, until like probably later when I was at Wellesley. But um, when I finished my time at, at Tufts, my four years, I didn't feel like I was done with you know college basketball and I really wanted to be around the game and I was really curious about coaching so I talked to you know my head coach at the time Janice Savitz um, who had taken over the program my junior year and just asked her if um, you know if I could stick around and, and coach a little bit and learn and do whatever she needed to be done um, so I was really lucky I got to do that um, and I did that for two years after college before going back to law school while I was in law school, I still actually did some scouting for her. So if there was local games I could make it to, you know, go go down and sit sit in the gym live and, and take notes on games. So I still kind of stayed with the game, um, coached Bay State games in the summers. And um, after law school and once I was working with the Department of Labor, um, the Wellesley coach, head coach, reached out and they were in need of someone to join their staff as she was going out on maternity leave. And I thought to myself, you know what, sure, I, you know, I can do anything for a year. It's going to be a struggle in terms of timing. Um, 
But when you work for the federal government, there's oftentimes you can set your schedule so that you can go in. At, I would go in at six in the morning and you know leave at two thirty, three o'clock, um, so I could make it to all the practices, which seemed like a lot. But again, I was like, it's only a year. You know, this is an opportunity to give back, help out this program, um, learn a little bit more on the way, and and um, absolutely fell in love with it doing that. Um, and stayed on her staff for six years. She was always in my ear about um, Kathy Hagerstrom about. Um, doing it full time, but there was a part of me that's like, well, I went to law school. I really like what I'm doing during the day as well um, with the Department of Labor and then Fidelity Investments. So I liked my day job a lot, but the passion was always towards coaching. And the MIT job opened up. It was NCA compliance combined with being the head coach, and it just felt like a great fit having my JD. Um, my passion for coaching, coaching at a high academic school like MIT down the street, you know, don't need to relocate, um, a school that I always just had so much admiration for on the outside looking in, even my whole family going all the way back to India, you know, certainly um, held MIT in, in high esteem. So it felt like a no-brainer, um, and it, it felt um, like something that I was ready to do, and so I, I jumped in with both feet. But in terms of balancing it, I think you find a way when it's something you really love to do. Um, and as I mentioned, I, I liked Whenever I had, you know, the, the dual responsibility, I always liked both. So it was just a matter of, you know, being organized and, and fortunately having great staffs at MIT helped me with that a lot as well. Yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty incredible. And, I, and we're, we have huge admiration for you for doing that. Um, I guess, Sika, in a way, we, I know what it takes to be a, a triathlete just from covering triathlons for a very long time. It takes a lot of hours. And so how did you balance a full-time job in, in, at Ferguson and, and the hours that you need to put in, especially for training for half Ironmans or Ironman distance races? Honestly, I'm sorry. Also, one other thing. What did you learn from being an athlete at Tufts that um, sort of was intrinsic inside of you to help you kind of do this? Well, I still feel like I'm trying to figure out how to balance everything. <laughs> um, I, you know, I, I'm still racing regularly. I just did a half Ironman in Mexico last weekend and I'm still working a full-time corporate job. So listening to Sonia talk about following her passion and figuring out, you know, which direction she wanted to pursue is interesting. Um, I may need to call her after this. But for me, I think it helped um, being a student athlete uniquely prepared me for the situation I'm in right now. Um, I'm sure any student athlete can relate to this between, you know, waking up early in the morning and lifting and then going to your classes and getting your homework done and then training with the team and making sure you go to bed at a decent hour. It's almost like I'm going through that still now. So I think that was really helpful. Um, and in terms of balancing things currently, um, I'm very lucky that I've been with my corporation now for 12 years um, and they support me 100% in what I'm pursuing. So when I do need to travel out of the country or out of town for a race, um, they let me <laughs> and I just have to make up the work when I get back. Um, and then also I just found a schedule that works for me. I train on my lunch break and then I train again after work. Um, so I use my time as efficiently as possible. Um, for me, I guess it's just no idle time. Um, you know, I make a to-do list every single day and I just try to follow it as strictly as possible. And, and I've just accepted what it takes to get to um, an elite level in sports. And I look at it as, instead of a sacrifice, I guess more of an investment. Right. That's great. Um, Sonia, head coach um, Taylor Jenkins said this about you. She has a high basketball IQ and a tremendous ability to teach the game, as well as a strong passion for the game. Can you tell us a little bit about your transition to being an assistant coach in the NBA? What was the most difficult part about the transition? Um, and what kind of techniques do you use in coaching um, male players. I mean, your experience has been coaching female athletes. Now you're coaching male professional players and, you know, including the likes of Rookie of the Year John Morant and now you're playing against players like LeBron James and Steph Curry and Kevin Durant. How do you, how did you make that transition and, and what made you qualify for that position? Well, to go back to, I think your, the first part of your question was, um, you know, the transition, maybe what was challenging about it. I think going from feeling like I, I really was comfortable where I was and I knew, you know, to a large degree what I was doing 
you know, I knew the ebbs and flows of a season, um, you know, what the, what to expect, you know, with our opponents, um, you know, kind of what the DNA is of every team we played against, what the head coach might do in a situation, what can I, you know, what I can anticipate. And, you know, coming to the NBA and to the Grizzlies, I, you know, it feels like it's a reset. You know, I'm starting over. I'm building that knowledge base. I'm kind of building that, like, mental database of what each team does, what each coach does, um, what the different, you know, in terms of X's and O's, like what a different defensive coverage might look like and then what the counters might be to that. So I think the challenge is coming in and really knowing nothing um, and coming from a situation where you felt like you knew a good amount to now not knowing anything really and, and starting it's not really starting over but it's kind of a, a reset like I said so um, so just being patient with that process and I've always enjoyed the process of getting better um, but I haven't always been patient in that way so I think just reminding myself that this takes time you know I didn't have that knowledge at MIT in the first minute I got you know through the door it took some time to build all of that and it'll be the same here um, I think you know, relying on your colleagues, you know, the, the Taylor Jenkins, who you mentioned, our head coach, and then the whole coaching staff, the assistant coaches, the video coordinator, player development staff, um, they're all really helpful. So really just utilizing everyone around you, not being afraid to ask questions and um, to make mistakes and really getting out of my comfort zone. You know, I think that's been really um beneficial for me at this stage in my career to to be in this situation I didn't really ever think I would be um, I was really happy you know being at MIT so um, so that's you know and in terms of differences coaching men or women um, that doesn't really feel as big of a difference certainly coaching division three versus coaching professional athletes you know going from students who have to balance their day between you know four or five classes and internships and labs and then racing to practice and you know barely have much to give by the time they get to five o'clock um, those those present a unique set of challenges I think professional athletes you know Asika can attest to um, present a, a set of challenges as well um, and you know this is what they do and this is what they do you know all day long so in in some ways I have more time to dedicate to it but the rigors the demands um, you know a 72 game schedule this year compressed into a small time frame you know this week alone we have four games in five days and that's a pretty common um, rhythm for us this this season so all of that has been an adjustment but I think um, the players are just really committed to getting better so as a coach if you you know show them that you care about them that you provide them with some tools that might help them you know in the upcoming game or in, in the middle of a game um, they're really receptive to it and I think that's that's a commonality more than anything that I've seen at you know both levels I've coached. That's actually so great to hear because you know from an outsider looking in, you would think I know that you have the respect, utmost respect of your, of the head coach and the management, uh, you know, of, of the Grizzlies. But I was kind of sort of thinking, God, I you know I wonder how the players um, reacted um, and you know to to you and to things that you had to say. And I'm glad to hear that they do um, that they were receptive and and clearly. Um, take a lot from what you're offering, which is great. Um, Sika, um, you know, Sonia had mentioned that, she, she, you know, she had an injury while she was at Tufts that really was sort of a life-changing situation for her. I know that you um, persevered through an accident that you had during a race a couple of years ago, a half Ironman race, where you were um, out of uh, out of competition and out of training for over five months. Could you tell us about that moment in time for you and tell us what motivated you to really, you know, not to sound cliche, but get back on the get back on the bike and get back in the pool and get back on the road and, and do it again. What really was that the, mo the genesis of that motivation? Well, that was one of the most difficult periods of my life. Um, I was racing a half Ironman in Texas, and this wasn't that long ago. It was in 2019. And a competitor swerved in front of me when I was riding over 25 miles per hour on the bike, and I went face first into the pavement, and um, I was completely knocked unconscious. I didn't wake up until hours later. I was in the emergency room and um, you know they told me the severity of my injuries I had broken my nose my teeth were loose I had severe lacerations on my face I had to get uh, over 40 stitches um, I had a splint put in my mouth I couldn't eat solid food for a month so 
Um, I guess when I first looked at myself in the mirror, I was just like, I quit. <laughs> like, this isn't worth it. The, I, I could have died. And, you know, part of me was really grateful that I wasn't paralyzed because I've heard of other people who have had the same type of crash by bicycling accident as me and they've ended up paralyzed or worse. So, um, yeah, my initial reaction was that I quit. Um, but then I flew from the hospital to my parents' house and I stayed with them for a while and one of my one of the questions my dad asked was if you knew all this was going to happen to you would you still but you would still go on to get your pro card you would turn pro would you go through with all this and my without hesitation i was like absolutely that would still mean the world to me um my goal had been to be the first african-american woman to turn pro in triathlon and that's what i was aiming towards and it just felt like my journey in the sport wasn't done yet like that crash wasn't supposed to be it. Um, and then also I've been kind of chronicling and sharing my stories through the years, uh, through my blog since 2013 of me chasing this dream. So I got all this mail and like letters from kids and people of color that were like, keep going, keep chasing your dreams. And, you know, we've been following and we wish you the best of luck, get back out there. And it just meant the world to me. Um, it felt like in that moment that what I was chasing mattered and that diversity and representation in the sport mattered. So I decided that I was going to get back out there. And five months after that accident, I uh, did my did a half Ironman. Sika, that is so inspiring. And congratulations for being able to really persevere and, and get through that and be you know, better than ever. Um, I wanted to go back to um, the concept of diversity and representation. Sonia, I know that that's really important to you. I mean, in a million years, did you ever imagine that you would be on the bench coaching during an NBA playoff? And what does that mean to you personally? And if you could just talk a little bit about diversity and, and representation and how you feel about that in the sport. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, Sika mentioned it just now, the you know letters and messages that she has been receiving um, from from young people, young African Americans who are looking up to her, and and um, I think that's when it really hit home for me how important it was. Um, I, I think growing up for me, um, you know, there wasn't much representation in terms of South Asian people in sports in general in the U.S. Um, and then certainly not in basketball. So um, it just sort of became the norm um, that I would almost always be the only one, um, and it really it didn't phase me it just was that was a reality but as I started to um, get later into my career coaching um, going to tournaments and recruiting I started to see more and more um, you know South Asian kids playing basketball at these tournaments um, recruiting you know Indian American um, high school players talking to their families and the connection that I had there um, and hearing their stories it sound it reminded me a lot of, of me growing up but you know it was it was um, much more than norm now um, and so I think taking this job um, you know there was a fair amount of um, you know publicity around it when it first happened and um, I started to hear from you know Indian Americans um, you know from Tufts um, across the country people who are interested in either following a coaching path or another path to get into the NBA or just really excited to see um, see that representation and I think that's when I started to really it really hit home for me what it means um, to have that and how important it is and you know the the role and responsibility I have to help open those doors to that next generation and um, really embracing that and being excited about it but it, it it's important you know it's really important not just um, you know, not just Indian Americans, but in general, you know, people of color and um, raising those opportunities, um, whether it's coaching or it's in the front office, you know, in, in the, you know, business of sports, um, I think more diversity. I mean, certainly there's studies that show that it leads to more success um, and it shows the opportunities that are out there and it might lead to um, just drawing more and more talent to your organization as well. Absolutely. Um, so we, we are at the point of the night or afternoon that we um, are going to take some questions from, from the crowd. Um, this first one isn't a question, but it's more of like a, hey, how you doing um, to Sonia? It's from Marcy Hatchcroft, J96. 
Um, your roommate yeah, hi, Marcy. <laughs> from freshman year. <laughs> she wants you to know that we're all really proud of the amazing success you have achieved in your coaching career. And she just you know, wanted us to give you a shout out. So, hey, Sonia <laughs> from Marcy. That's so sweet. Hi, Marcy. Hope you're doing well. <laughs> Great to hear from you. Um, the next one is from John Adamato um, the third. It's also for Sonia. What is one of the skills you use currently that you learned or honed in at Tufts that other students there should learn or hone in while they're in college? Um, you know, I think a lot. I, I grew up so much in my four years in college at Tufts, um, both being on the basketball team um, and from, you know, other friends I had off, you know, that were outside of the basketball program, like John. Um, I think resilience is really um, important and something that I, I picked up and, you know, in my time there. Um, dealing with injuries, you know, dealing with, um, you know, scrapping to be that walk on that gets on the squad and, and stays on. Um, balancing academics and athletics. So I, I think the resilience and, and figuring out how to, you know, deal with adversity um, was a big one. Certainly, you know, organization and balance, um, being able to find time to do everything. You, you have to be organized when you're, you know, in season, out of season. Um, so I think that and, and certainly um, some of the leadership skills that I acquired along the way. Um, but I think the biggest thing was just the value of teamwork and collaboration. You know, even as a leader, I'm always, I always lean really heavily towards collaboration as a leader um, and, you know, really valuing other people's opinions, understanding that, you know, the best opinions sometimes might be ones that are different than yours and embracing that and learning from other people. So, um, you know, a lot, really. Um, I learned a lot in my time at Tufts and from the people that I met there. Great. And also, hi, John. <laughs> <laughs> and this one is from um, Emma Clutterbuck, um, class of uh, 2020. And Sika, if you want to start, um, what recommendations do you have for recent grads trying to break into the sports industry? And I know that your career is, your um, financial career is not the sports industry, but I think as being a professional athlete, you probably are, um, you know, working with many people in the sports industry from your bike um, companies and from sponsorships. sponsorships, et cetera. Do you have any recommendations for grads who are trying to break into the sports business? Uh, well, I just qualified for my pro card last weekend. <laughs> so I only have a Congratulations. week. Congratulations. That's yeah. awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah, just going back a little. So after that race in 2019, when I finally came back um, to 2020, I was going to try to chase my pro card. And the pandemic happened and all of my races were canceled. So I just tried to stay as motivated as possible for a year. And then this year, finally, races started happening again. And my goal was still the same to become the first African-American woman to turn pro. And I finally just did that last week. So I'm actually meeting with an agent now and trying to figure out the whole sporting industry. Um, I'm very lucky that um, I've been pretty active with sports, swimming, biking, and running for the past few years. So I've connected with a lot of companies. And for me, in order to break into the industry, I would say to network. Networking is really important. Um, I've met people through like sports conferences and um, you know, grab their business card and then immediately when I got back home, sent them an email and um, just developed relationships over time. And I think nowadays uh, the new generation is pretty lucky because a lot of it has to do with social media presence and maybe not necessarily how fast you are in a sport or something like that. So um, for me, it's just been about networking and it's not what you know, it's who you know. So you know, if you if you know somebody already connected through the industry to, you know, reach out to them. Right. Sonia, do you have anything to add to, to that? Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Networking, build relationships with people, um, use the alumni directory and alumni database. I mean, I've actually heard from people from Tufts um, through that avenue. And anytime someone from Tufts reaches out, they go to the top of, you know, my my you know to-do list like I, I want to hear from jumbos and, and respond to them I think most people do you know there's an affinity for your alma mater and, and I have such great memories of my time at Tufts so take advantage of that there's a lot of people that graduated from Tufts that are in the sports industry and depending on what your interest is your avenue your path um, you know make those connections and you know and learn from anyone that you can learn from um, and you know follow whatever path you think is is right for you um, but, you know, 
work hard at it. You, you want to make sure that you're prepared. Um, it can't just be, you know, seek a reference social media. I feel the same way. It can't just be, you know, a social media presence. There has to be some substance and some, some content behind it. So um, be prepared, work hard, um, and then, you know, bet on yourself and, and go out there and really try to, um, to find those people that um, you can really learn from. Right, absolutely. I, you know, it's interesting because Lisa and I were poli sci majors. You were um, an IR major and an um, seek an economics major, um, which has nothing to do with sports. But that's why I think Tufts is so great. You know, you get a great liberal arts education, and then you can you can take what you're passionate about. And for Lisa and I, we were three sport athletes, and you know, wanted to be professional athletes, but that wasn't going to be a possibility for us. So what better? So we're in awe of you, Sika. It's <laughs> awesome. But we decided to kind of pursue a career in sports television because we were passionate about sports. Um, so I think being passionate about um, something and trying to pursue a career that's related to what you're passionate about is important. But I actually had a, another question for Sonia because I, I read somewhere that um, your original call from the Grizzlies was looking for uh, math, uh, super smart math students. Can you tell us how math correlates to professional basketball? And, and then furthermore correlates into you being um, hired <laughs> as an assistant coach. Yeah. <laughs> Um, well, I think the STEM field in general um, is huge in the sports industry right now. Um, analytics, both on the business side and on the you know basketball operations side, um, same with other professional leagues, is um, certainly growing rapidly. Um, and so, yes, the Grizzlies, their VP of uh, Basketball Strategy, Rich Cho, reached out to me um, looking for potential um, interns or recent grads for entry-level positions. Um, within the organization and I just thought like how how smart is that you know they're gonna be able to tap into a group of exceptional women you know high academics um, also you know strong in computer science or math or um, some sort of engineering discipline that really teaches you how to be process oriented and analytical and um, a, be a problem solver in general so uh, it, those are great fields to be in and they do translate really well um, to the sports industry. So, uh, you know, again, going back to the advice on networking and, and but also building authentic relationships, um, getting to know Rich was very much authentic. He was, you know, a really, really nice person. I enjoyed um, communicating with him. And so that just kind of grew um, organically. And he was coming up to Boston to bring his daughter to um, watch some local college volleyball games and, you know, just check out campuses. Um, so I offered to show them around campus and introduce them to the volleyball coach. And in that time of, you know, spending a couple hours walking around Cambridge, um, got to know him a little bit better, got to know the organization and, and some of the overall values and goals of the Grizzlies a little bit more. So when the time came that there was an opening, you know, he reached out and um, there was already a, a relationship there. So, um, you know, it was a little bit more, um, a little less daunting for me to, to kind of say, okay, yes, let's do this interview and let's see where it goes. That's amazing. Um, pretty incredible. Um, Sika, I, 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 who was the coach back, um, back when you were doing track and field at Tufts? Uh, she's still there now, Coach Morwick, Kristen Morwick. Right. Have, have you been in touch with, with her? And um, does she know that you're doing these endurance events, given the fact that you couldn't even stand running a mile back in the day? Oh, oh we're extraordinarily close. We talk all the time. Uh, she And she's on social media. So she'll, you know, I'll post, um, you know, if I do a marathon or something, I'll post about it in the time. And she's like, I couldn't even get you to run a mile. And now you're out there running a marathon at the end of an Ironman. So, uh, yeah, no, it, it's pretty funny. We have good... Uh, we, we laugh about it pretty often. Right. And then, and then Sonia, too, um, you know, you, you were playing basketball in the 90s when the, there was transition among the coaches. I think you had three coaches um, while you were at Tufts alone. Um, and now, over the past, you know, five to ten years, they've really changed the program, and they're, they're you know, in the NC2As almost every year. Can, have you been following the Jumbos, and um, how proud of you are you to be con in the, in the oh, Jumbo absolutely. basketball family? I, I, never, I never stop following, I never stop rooting. Uh, so proud to be a Jumbo and seeing what the program um, has done. Um, from when, um, you know, Carla Berube took over and her time there um, really transformed that program into, you know, four Final Fours, 
um, two appearances in national championship game. I, you know, I went to a ton of games outside of, you know, when I didn't have games, you could see me as kind of a permanent fixture over at Cousins. And I do miss being able to go to games. You know, I'll miss that now. But, um, you know, I was able to, you know, go to one of their final fours, go to one of their national championship games. You know, Carla became my best friend. Um, so really close with the programs, to, so close that I never wanted to schedule Tufts on, you know, to play against. <laughs> right. um, uh, you know, tried to keep it like we're, we're two separate um, things so that I could really share and collaborate. I learned a lot from what they did and their successes. And now, um, you know, to see Jill Pace um, take over the program, she was a former assistant there and also a really good friend of mine. Um, and I think she's doing really great things with the program as well. Looking forward to seeing them get back out there and compete. I know they lost a year this year of being able to compete with, with COVID, and um, but I, I respect that you know Tufts is keeping people safe um, up there in Medford, and I think that's a really good thing. Um, so I think we're all excited to see them get back out there next year. Yeah, yeah definitely. Um, one other question about the differences and the similarities of um, coaching men and versus women. Um, I have a daughter and a son, and I coached them all the way from kindergarten through high school. And there were, I can think about several differences between coaching boys and girls. Um, what, what are the differences, do you think? The, um, and some could be negative, some could be positive. I'm just curious about your perspective now having coached both at a high level. <laughs> You know, I don't know if I have a big enough sample size. You know, I just have these this group of 17 men um, who are professional athletes, you know, to compare to the, you know, 100 or so women that I coached in Division III. Um, so I, I'm not sure if it's – if the jury might still be out for me on this. Um, I think that going back to what I said earlier, I think that what struck me the most was how, how many similarities there are. Um, you know, I thought maybe um, – Coaching women, you know, might be there might be more like sensitivities and then coaching men, it won't be that way, you know, and that was foolishly so like that's actually not the case. Um, you know, coaching, uh, coaching men, there, there can be that same type of, you know, um, emotion and sensitivity. There can also be um, the other end of it, you know, so I think people are people, you know, I don't think that the differences are as as a, like as on much on a gender line um, as as I would have thought coming into it so I think this job has really opened my eyes to um, all the different types of people that I coach the women at MIT and a small level I'm seeing that same thing here with the Grizzlies um, and you know there's there's introverts there's extroverts there's you know the the ones that are going to be cracking all the jokes. There's the ones that are going to be really intense. Um, the ones that can kind of move on from a loss a little bit better than the next person. Um, the ones that hang on to things a little bit. You know, there's there's all of that. Um, and you know, I think that's probably the thing that the, it's the similarities really that surprise me the most. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. All right. Last question because we want to be respectful of your time. Um, Sika, are you going to um, pursue long distance like Ironman distance tries, or this could be a little too inside try? But um, or are you going to go for uh, the Olympic distance? And could we see you um, at the next Olympics? <laughs> no, you definitely won't see me at the next Olympics. Um, the not the next Olympics. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I prefer uh, non-draft legal. So the Olympics is uh, legal. So um, it's when you're in, you're on a road bike and you're drafting off of each other. So it's very different than long course like I do. I tend to do better as it as the event goes long. So I'll probably stick to the half Ironman distance and um, I'll make my pro debut actually next month um, at a half Ironman in Virginia. Yeah. Well, we wish you the best of luck. Nancy actually did a half Ironman. Um, right. This is a funny story, and then we'll wrap up. But um, I think you'll appreciate this, or maybe not. Um, <laughs> I had trained for a half um, that was going to happen in San Diego, and it was the year of the major fires out on the West Coast. Okay. And so the race was canceled. And I had trained for you know months and months and months. So I said to Lisa, who had just finished producing the Ironman, I was like, what am I going to do? I have like, you know, 70.1 in my legs right now and I, I got to do one. Right. So she got me into the world championships. <laughs> so I was like an amateur in the world championships, the world pro championships. And all my friends were covering it. So we have like eight camera coverage of Nancy finishing. She finished. Right. And I wasn't last, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, it's so nice to talk with you guys. I, you know, if, if you have anything else you'd like to add, please feel free to do it now. And um, I hope um, we cross paths with both of you down the road because um, you're a huge inspiration to all of us. Oh, no, I was just going to say thank you for uh, having us on and letting me tell my story. 
course. Same. Um, you know, thank you so much. It was really an honor to be on a panel with the three of you. Sika, good luck um, next next month, and congrats on your pro card. Really inspiring. And um, Lisa and Nancy, you actually planted a seed many years ago. Uh, my senior year at Tufts, um, you came and spoke on a panel, um, and it was in person. You know, and um, and it was about careers in sports for women, and you know, you were the featured guest, and I was so inspired by what you were doing, producing and working with the Olympics, and I was like, wow, there's, there's so much out there. Um, so you know, early on, I think you, you two were very inspiring to me, so thank you all. Um, thank you so much, Sonia, you just gave me chills. Usually I'm the one who gives so much chills. <laughs> so such a pleasure, and um, really appreciate your time, and best of luck in the postseason, and best of luck in your new races, and as a pro, and, um, Go Jumbos! Go Jumbos! (laughs) Go Jumbos!